All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the New Ridge Line podcast. I'm Devin Dunnigan, and here with me, as always, is Mr. Stephen Mott. How you doing, Stephen? Great, brother. Jake Z's a, a drummer. All righty, so we are back this week with another album review, and this time we're going to be reviewing the 1996 album by Molly Hatchett, Devil's Canyon. So this is their eighth studio record. It was released June 24th, 1996, recorded at Cairo Studios, Raquel, Germany, and released on the SPB slash CBH label, produced by Kel Trapp, Bobby Ingram, and Rainer Hansel. So yeah, this is a brand new era for the band. This featured an entirely new band, minus two people on here, and... Originally, it was supposed to feature their original singer, but things happened, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. So, I mean, Molly Hatchet by this point, had already been through a plethora of lineup changes, even up to their third album. I mean, they had lost their original singer after the first two records, and they brought in a new singer. And while the first album they did with him did pretty well, the second album didn't fare quite as well, but still a great record nonetheless and was headed in more of a, a straight-ahead hard rock direction instead of a southern rock direction. But regardless, I mean, eventually they reunite with Danny Joe Brown and you have all these lineup changes going from 1983 through 1989 eventually with the band disbanding in 1990 and then later reforming in 1990 i mean just by that you can tell this band's history has been very rocky so bobby ingram and john galvin who are on this record had both played with the band prior to this album and when the band disbanded in 1990, Danny Joe Brown and Bobby Ingram picked the band back up and reformed it with no original members except for Danny Joe Brown. And Bobby Ingram took over as the band leader once Danny Joe Brown had to take leave from the band for good. So, I mean, up to this point, many lineup changes, as you can tell. And I mean, yeah. We get to this record, another entirely new lineup, and several of these members were part of the band right before recording. I have a bootleg of a show right before this album was recorded to where they do perform a pretty good amount of songs from this record, either instrumentally or actually with vocals. And most of the band that's on this record are on that other than the bass player and keyboardist and, of course, lead vocalist. But eventually, the bassist, Buzzy Meekins, who was previously of Danny Joe Brown's solo band, he left the band at some point around the recording of this album, and they brought in Andy McKinney, and then their previous keyboard player, I believe it was Andy Orth at that time, he left, and they brought back John Galvin, and... Danny Joe Brown did start recording the record, or I don't think he's really started recording the record. He just, they started pre-production and he couldn't do it. He was forced to retire due to health conditions. And that was the case for when he left in 1980, the first time around. But yeah, I mean, eventually he was replaced by Phil McCormick. Originally, the idea was floated around for them to bring, bring back their original replacement singer, Jimmy Farrar, but supposedly it just didn't fare that well, and they brought in Phil McCormick from the Road Ducks, and he stayed with the band until his death in 2019, and to me, Phil McCormick took over kind of the role of the heart and soul of the band in place of Danny Joe Brown, and I mean, it's... Many, many lineup changes after this album, but to me, this is a very solid lineup, and 
I love this record. I've always really enjoyed this album. I've reviewed it on my channel. I've done a couple of different reviews of it. It's the same one, just re-edited. And then there's another that has the DVD from this tour that I reviewed. And I mean, if you want a little companion piece to this episode, go check that out. But yeah, I mean, I love this album. Great album. In my top three Molly Hatchet records, I think this is the best since the first two albums. So I think a whole lot of this record. So, yeah, I mean, this is the first album since 1989. And it, that album even kind of showed you where they would go, this record, in a lot of ways. But, yeah, I mean, really good record. Love Molly Hatchet. I've always loved Molly Hatchet. So, Steve. Talk about how you discovered the band and your opening thoughts on this album. Well, I think it was the first one since 1989. And back now, I'm just kidding. Uh, I guess so. Uh, anyway, I got kind of sidetracked there. But really, Molly Hatchet, I didn't know any. I really still don't know a whole lot about other than what Devin has told me told me about i hadn't looked much up about them and i hadn't really ever heard of the whole album by them all the way through as it, uh that i recollect as such until now devil's canyon i think actually we might have reviewed one before the deed is done or something or that might have been just Devin. i can't remember but <clears throat> i think i have heard of the whole album but i just don't remember it that good it must it must not have been too good but uh it must have been better than this one uh because it's bad <laughs> so i don't know i just don't know back to you devin all righty so let's get on into this record with the first track on here down from the mountain so this really kicks the album off the bang and i've always really enjoyed this song this paved the way for how a lot of the albums after this would open up, especially the next album, Silent Reign of Heroes, which is pretty much beat for beat, this album all over again. But yeah, I love this song, Was Performed Live. This is one of the songs off the album that made it into the set after this tour. There's quite, I just, there's a few actually that's made it into the set after this tour, but I mean, yeah, I really, really love this song. It, fits in nicely with Molly Hatchet and this whole album to me is a very kind of modernized version of the original sound and I think that's a pretty interesting way to go about it and they do take different directions on the next several albums but I mean yeah I love this track. I could totally see Danny Joe Brown singing on this one. I love this song. So, Steve, you take Down from the Mountain. Track number one. I like the lead guitar, or lead slide guitar, rather. Uh, but the rest sucks. Now, Devin, I would like to ask a question. Uh, who... If not for if not if it's not the same person for every song, who is the lead guitar player for this album? Well, it swaps between two different people. Bobby Ingram is the more prominent lead player, but you do have Brian Bassett performing solos here and there. It, it's kind of hard to tell. I don't have the CD or anything like that, so it, it may tell more about it in the liner notes of the CD. I have no idea, but. Yeah, I mean, it's most likely Bobby Ingram. I think that was the way they did it live. He played lead on this song. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just saying, like, if it was the whole, it, if it was like one person for the whole thing, but I mean, not to get too detailed with it or nothing. But uh, anyway, I just, I thought that was a cool thing with the, with the slide, you know, something different with them. And uh, I, I think, I think this is one of the songs that, that doesn't i'll say that doesn't sound like that they were trying to copy skinner but um the otherwise for the other songs so 
Back to you, Devin. All righty. So then we move to track number two, Rolling Thunder. So this was written with Danny Joe Brown before the recording of this album. I have a show with this on there, and Danny Joe Brown sings it, and he does a fantastic job on it. That's the one thing with this whole entire record. I really wish Danny Joe Brown could have done at least one last album and then maybe Phil McCormick picked up the helm for or picked up the pieces for the tour or whatever. But, I mean, things didn't pan out that way. And Phil McCormick does a fantastic job. This is Phil McCormick in top form. I mean, this whole album to me vocally is he's in top form on this record and Phil McCormick, I, like I said earlier, I think he picked up exactly where Danny Joe left off as far as being kind of the heart and soul of Molly Hatchet. But yeah, I love this song has also a co-write from Banner Thomas, the original basses talking about the different lineup changes earlier when I kind of got off on a long drawn out tangent about that. But, Banner Thomas was part of the band at some point or another during this time period, or right. He was, I think, he was a part of it around '94. He's in a promotional picture, which is the last promotional picture that Danny Joe Brown was a part of in the band, and he's a part of that that photo shoot and all. And he played some shows with them, and he helped write this song. This song sounds like classic Molly Hatchet was performed live. Like I said, with Down from the Mountain, this is kind of modern. This is a modernized version of the original sound. And I think with that said, it's amazing. It's a great song. And I could totally see the original band doing this song. I, I really love it and kind of paved the way for a lot of what the band would write about on subsequent albums after this. Um, yeah, I love it. I think this is a fantastic song. So, Stephen Tate, Rolling Thunder. Next, um, number three. The production sounds cheap and muddy, and the songwriting is just horrible. They sound like a bad Leonard Skinner cover bar band. <laughs> and the production does not help any. Now, I have a, <clears throat> sorry for the cough, I have a suspicion that you know, because this is not on the official Molly Hatchet channel, that maybe that's why the audio doesn't sound as good. But then again, I'm not really sure. But because this is this is kind of one of those, you know, fan or random person upload to this of this whole album. And it's not even on their actual channel. And I guess it's over legal reasons or the record company or some bull crap because it's in Germany or something, but it's just stupid. It's the stupidest crap I've ever seen in my life that it's not on their actual channel. Because, I mean, of the, you know, of the albums, I mean, this is probably their their better work. But I don't know. Anyway, uh, I think it, if it would have been on the, on the Molly Hatchet official channel that it would have came through a lot clearer with the production and with the C with the C D actually sounding pretty good, but this particular version on YouTube does not sound that good. It's like too it's like overly loud and it's it's like sounds terrible, like cheap. I'm pretty sure that's not the way they actually sounded though. But um I'm kinda of talking in circles now. So besides the point, it's just not a very good song and the whole album sounds very bad as far as the sound for the songs and uh the producer need to be fired and back to you devin <laughs> all righty so were you talking about track number two or track number three here well track number three but kind of the whole album okay and that's that's good enough so that kind of bridges the gap in the track number three, actually, so Devil's Canyon, the title track, this one has made it into the set list way past the tour. They're still doing this song today. I mean, it's never left the set list since this album's release in 1996, and it's fantastic. This is a great song. 
co-written by Danny Joe Brown once again. There's a live version out there on YouTube you can listen to. I'll probably put that in the description when I upload this video. But yeah, I really, really love this song. This is a fantastic song. This set the tone or set the trend for where they would go with the subsequent albums of having kind of this epic title track. They would do the same on the next record with Silent Reign of Heroes. They would skip out on Kingdom of Twelve, and then they would pick back up kind of somewhat with Warriors of the Rainbow Bridge, except with it being called simply Rainbow Bridge. And then that that was really not an epic song. It was more kind of like a Beatles-esque, Beatles-esque sort of ballad song, but still kind of in that epic range. And then they really do a good one with their last album that they put out, Justice, and that song was just simply fantastic. So, yeah, I love Devil's Canyon. It's a cla- it's a modern classic Molly Hatchet song. I love it. And I think, really, if they were going to put out a single for this album, I'll talk about the one that they did actually release for, this, for the album, but this and Rolling Thunder should have definitely have been singles off this record i think that would have really helped this but i mean i i mean who knows it, things happened and the band is a lot bigger in germany than they are over here i mean they they call that their home away from home for a reason so i mean yeah i, I love this song i think it's fantastic and yeah steve Take it once again with more of the same as you was talking about earlier. So, Steve? Yeah, um, it, it's like the song by <laughs> Whitesnake, Always the Same. <laughs> uh, so, since I talked about number three for number two, I'll switch it around. I'll talk about number two for number three. So, track number two, the lead guitar player sounds like he's trying to be like Gary Rosington. And it all just sucks bad. <laughs> oh, back to you, Devin. All righty. So then we move to track number four, Heartless Land. So this is a really good song. This is written solely by Brian Bassett. And really, really good song. I really enjoy this song. And it's kind of, kind of an epic, but... It's just an overall really good song. I really enjoy this. And the little coda at the end, I really, really enjoy that as well. I think that's a really cool way to carry this song out. And it's kind of combining the elements of an epic with sort of a pop rocker, sort of. And I really enjoy this song. I think this is really, really good. And maybe this could have actually been released as a single. So. Yeah, I really enjoy Heartless Land. So, Steve, take this song. Well, number four, I hope. (laughs) This song made me absolutely go nuts. Uh, it, It, I just had a complete fit halfway through this song. I just had to cut it off. It, It just was getting on my nerves, and it just unnerved me to my earthly, just divine core. I could not stand it. And I just started through it, throwing stuff at the wall. It did not stop for like two solid hours. I cussed, shook, shook the wall, jumped up and down, and um they called me the bandit. So <laughs> it was it was that bad. So then we moved to track number five, Never Say Never. So this was originally a song called Brian's Boogie when they were forming this song in the clubs before this album's recording. And on the show I was talking about earlier, this is on there as Brian's Boogie. And it's it's a good song. It's a kind of a bluesy shuffle. And I think it's a really, really cool song. This is written by Brian Bassett and Phil McCormick. So, yeah, I really, really enjoy this one. A little bit more of a simplistic song for the album. and. I think that really and truly helps this song is that it's kind of simplistic. So not much else to say there other than Steven, take this track. Um, 
I don't see how anyone likes this crap. Verbatim notes, chapter one. Uh, this number five track, uh, I just cannot stand it. Uh, and simple as that. It had the same rhythm for every song. Uh, it's like they just, I just, man, I just really don't know. I mean, so back to you, Devin. All righty. So then we move to track number six, Tatanka. So this is another one that was written during the time of them playing in clubs prior to recording this album. And yeah, I mean, this is a really, really good song. I really enjoy it. This was played sporadically throughout. Even more recently, this is one I would actually like to see them bring back into the set one of these days. I mean, it's a really, really good song. Well, it was called Tatanka when they were playing it in clubs. There's an instrumental version on this show I was talking about. And yeah, I really, really enjoy this song. I think it's 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 kind of a progressive rock style song and having that that kind of spoken word bit in the middle of it during a little breakdown and then even the solos very progressive sounding and it, it's an interesting structured song and i really enjoy it some great drumming by matt crawford who is very underrated i think and he was a really good drummer in this group so yeah I really enjoy the song Tatanka, so Steve, take this track. Uh, this song is terrible. Uh, I don't know what they were trying to do, but it's the same beat over and over, and uh, the drummer sucks, whoever it may be, and it needs to be Devin Dunnigan. All righty. So I believe actually the title Tatanka is, I believe, buff. it means buffalo. I could be wrong there, so... Don't quote me on that one. But then we move to track number seven, Come Hell or High Water. So this is kind of this sleazy groove kind of song. And I like the song. It, it, it's probably one of the only songs on this record I would call filler. But I still I still enjoy it. It's a pretty cool song. Was not performed live. In my knowledge, this would have actually, I, I would have, I could see this whole entire album being performed live. So, I mean, yeah, I like Come Hell or High Water, but it's probably one of my least favorites on the album. So, Steve, take Come Hell or High Water. I'm going to take it to a much darker place. Uh, I've already said this, but they had the same exact rhythm for every song. It's a blah, blah, blah. Um, so, it was, it was just like... It reminded me of of something <laughs> Molly Hatchet might do. Uh, I don't know why that I could make that connection, but just somehow I did. Uh, maybe some late <clears throat> late nineties Molly Hatchet is what this sounds like to me. I don't know why. That may seem kind of like an off the wall comparison, but I don't know. So then we move to track number eight. The look in your eyes. So this is pretty much a power ballad, and it's a good song. I really do like this song. This kind of follows the trend of the previous albums having these more ballady tracks. Toward the end of the album, you had like kind of like love on No Guts No Glory. You had what was the one on the Vegas done? I think it was Stone in Your Heart, but that. That was kind of the middle of the album, and then you had one toward the end of the album on Strike Like Lightning, or Lightning Strikes Twice, not Strike Like Lightning. Lightning Strikes Twice with Goodbye to Love, which is really good, and this is kind of in the same vein as that song, and I really like the song. I think it's a good track, but I don't think this would have been the single if I was in charge. I mean, it's a good song. It's pretty commercial for what it is but I, I just don't think this is a very good single to represent this album i think like i said devil's canyon or rolling thunder would have been much better choices as singles but yeah i mean that's just my opinion i like the song though 
and really, really, really good song. So, Steve, take this track. Yeah, this is actually a really good song here. No kidding. Um, in my notes, I had it done, I know, nerves me to the core, but that's not, I put that for the wrong thing. This is actually a good song. All right, so then we move to the next track. Here you go, Stephen. Eat your heart out. So this is that's an inside joke for me and Steve, but this is more traditional Molly Hatchet. I feel like this would fit pretty well in the old school Molly Hatchet catalog. Probably the best out of this whole entire album. And this was written solely by Mac Crawford. So that's pretty interesting. And I mean, that, that riff, that straight ahead classic Molly Hatchet. But like Come Hill or High Water, I think this is one of the more fillerish tracks on here, but I still do like the song. So, so then we move to track number 10, The Journey. So this is a, this is another epic for the record. And this is a great friggin' song. This is really, really good. I mean, a pretty lengthy number on the album and is still being performed today. I mean, they've, Left this one in the set list, and it's really, really good. This is a very classic-sounding Molly Hatchet song. Phil McCormick, he he did really well on this song vocally, and yeah, I really enjoy this song. So, I mean, not much else I can say. It's just another epic on the album, and this kind of somewhat closes out the original period of the album, and we'll get into the... 11th track here in just a minute which is a little bit of old and a little bit of new so before we do Stephen, take the journey i just this is a pretty good song actually i kind of like the song and uh it's pretty good this is the one of two of the actually any any what somewhat decent good songs on the album and uh that's all i got to say it sounds pretty commercialized and this one sounds very similar uh, to the last track, not the last track, but a couple of ones back, the look in your eyes, because the, the, it's like the same sort of guitar parts in it, honestly. It's like the same thing in the chorus and stuff. If you listen real close, it's like the same style of production style and stuff. But uh, anyway, back to you, Devin. All righty, so then we close this album out, like I said a few minutes ago. A little bit old and a little bit of new, so this is an acoustic cover of Dreams I'll Never See. This is the second rendition of the song the band has done, and this would be the second of about four or five other ones, counting this one in the original rendition. And yeah, I really love this acoustic rendition, this kind of... Bridges the gap between the old version of Molly Hatchet and the new version of Molly Hatchet. Kind of passes the torch. And they did continue to do this sort of thing on the next two albums. They would do a acoustic rendition of Fall of the Peacemakers as well as Edge of Sundown for the album after that. And, I mean, it's dreams I'll never see. It's the song that's on the first Molly Hatchet album, but acoustic. And it's very atmospheric sounding. I, I think the whole instrumentation and the arrangement of the song really works. And Bill McCormick sounds really, really close to Danny Jill Brown on this particular song. Probably the closest on the entire album because while he does sound similar, he has kind of a different style than Danny Joe does, but. This is about the closest I think he gets on this record to sounding like Danny Joe just identic identical in ways, but if that makes any sense at all. But yeah, I mean, I really enjoy this rendition of the song. And I like the other two acoustic versions that they would do on the next two albums. And I think once again, he sounds a lot closer to Danny Jill Brown on those other two acoustic songs. So, yeah. Well, that brings an end to this album and an end to this review. So, I'll just go through the small little bits of 
thing, other things to talk about. I mean, there's not a whole lot of other backstory or charts or anything like that for this one. I've done been through the overall tale of the tape or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, I mean, this would set in to place the new Molly Hatchet band. And at this point in time, only two members off of this album are still with them. So the rest of the band have all left. And Phil McCormick, of course, has unfortunately passed away. And yeah, I mean, this would be the first of two albums for Matt Crawford. And the first of three for Brian Bassett and Andy McKinney. And this also set into place the collaboration between them and artist Paul Raymond Gregory, who painted the album cover, and he has painted all of the subsequent album covers. So that, that's a pretty interesting tidbit. And, and I mean, these photos are really, really good, and they fit re- very well with that classic kind of style for the earlier albums as far as the art art or artwork goes so yeah i really enjoy this record i give this probably probably to me this this is the best out of the prior molly hatchet i mean the best out of the phil mccormick bobby ingram led albums and i love all the other albums that they've done together with this group and this version of the band, and I love all the previous albums. So Molly Hatch, it's one of my favorite bands of all time. All righty, so that has been another episode of the New Ridge Line podcast with Devin Dunnigan and Stephen Mott. We all hope you enjoyed this review. Like, comment, subscribe. This will go out on the DTM Music. Well, it's now just DTM Podcast. And this will go out on that page. And be sure to check out all the other episodes of the DTM Podcast. We have quite a few under the banner DTM, but we also have a whole back catalog of episodes under the banner, the Dunnigan Mont Music and Movie Podcast. So. Be sure to check those out. I mean, get us some more subscribers and just just help support us and and help us out here. So, I mean, we'll eventually get on Podbean or on the Anchor page one of these days, most likely Podbean. So, I mean, yeah. All righty. We'll see you next time, guys. Thank you.
Let me hold you.